morning. Today is the 30th day of December 2015. We are continuing with our series, Seeking the New Poetry. Today, part one, Harindranath Chalapadye. There's so much to say about this man who lived in the ashram, especially 1933 and 34, and was a prodigious poet. There's a lot written about him by Sri Aurobindo and by others. Today, in this introduction, I'd like to just give you a background of the reason we began the series Seeking the New Poetry. For more than 50 years, I have been reading Savitri, and along with that, the future poetry. And in the future poetry, Sri Aurobindo mentions many poets who have caught something from the higher planes and brought it down. Likewise, Purani's book on savagery, an approach and a study, wherein he mentions also many poets who have caught something of those higher levels of intuition. And I've taken all of those names, and for months I have searched libraries, the internet, bookstores, for poems, books of poems of these poets. I have been greatly helped by two people, Ravi of the Sri Aurobindo International Center of Education, we know it as the Ashram School, and Devaranjan of the Sri Aurobindo Ashram Library, who found rare books for me of Harindranath's poetry. To begin, Harindranath was born on the 2nd of April, 1898, and passed away on the 23rd of June, 1990. He was a very multi-talented personality. Harin was an Indian-English poet, a dramatist, an actor, a musician, and a member of the first Lok Sabha from Vijayawada constituency. He was the younger brother of Sarojini Naidu, the second woman president of the Indian National Congress, and the first Indian woman to hold the position. Now, Sarojini Naidu is also a fine poet, and we will cover her poetry in future series. Today, I want to read to you the foreword by Jinaraja Dasa of the Theosophical Society. They published a book, The Divine Vagabond, which is a magnificent collection of Harin's poems. For over half a century, the poetry of England and the United States has been balefully influenced by the prevailing materialism of the age. They remind me of our Indian ants who bite the yellow rind only and never penetrate into the sweet pulp. The poetry of today, with its rhythms and imageries, appeals mainly to the mind, not that they are not exquisite in their way. They certainly do give delight. Yet, nevertheless, it can be said of these poets, "'Tis ye, tis your estranged faces that miss the many splendid thing." Of course, here and there are a few exceptions, like Alice Maynell, Francis Thompson, 
A.E. Yates, Cousins, and a few others. But in the main, I, who love poetry greatly, have felt a profound dissatisfaction with the poems I have read. It is the same with the poetry of Spanish America and Brazil, and without any depreciation of the artistic value of French poetry, we can say that the poetry of France for several centuries has never touched that other world, as did Wordsworth, Shelley, and Keats. When young Harindranath published, when at the age of 19, his first book of poems, The Feast of Youth, Dr. J. H. Cousins, who wrote the foreword, began by regretting that young Indian poets were not writing in the Indian vernaculars. But at the end of the foreword, he had to admit that our poet is a true bearer of the fire. It is this striking quality of his poems, written in such excellent English, that made Lawrence Binion, himself a poet, say of our poet, he has drunk from the same fount as Shelley and Keats. It was at the same time that Q, Quillacouch, who had read some of the poems, said regarding the admission of our poet as a research scholar in the University of Cambridge, we would have given Shelley and Keats a chance. Why not this young poet? From the first poems of Harin, which I read, I felt at once that here was the voice of ancient India, speaking in fine English, without losing in the least the true quality of Indian civilization and culture. Such a fine critic of literature as Sri Aurobindo, himself a poet, wrote, we may well hope to find in him a supreme singer of the vision of God in nature and life, and the meeting of the divine and human, which must be at first the most vivifying and liberating part of India's message to a humanity that is now touched everywhere by a growing will for the spiritualizing of the earth existence. Harindranath, as he is known to his friends, has a remarkable creative quality which has manifested itself not only in the usual verse forms. He created a play, Abu Hassan, the tale taken from the Arabian Nights, mostly versified, which was staged in Madras. The lyrics were to Indian tunes. And the dramatist in his play, The Sleeper Awakened, did a rare and venturesome thing in bringing in a certain number of actors as Brahmins, who sang English verse to ancient Vedic meter. With many others, I witnessed this play, which held us all thrilled with delight because of its intense charm and rollicking fun. Not the least of our poets' creations, as revealing India are the few verse plays wherein he dramatizes incidents in the lives of the famous Hindu saints. Tukaram, Raidas, the cobbler saint, Pundalik, and the saintly woman, Sakubai. When a few months ago, Harindranath brought me this book of poems, written in 1934. My instant reaction was that it should be published by the Theosophical Publishing House, as on three previous occasions. I am most glad to give all assistance
points to our poet's genius in his message, in whose wake no one else in India has followed. The soil of India is steeped with a certain atmosphere of mysticism and spirituality, which is at the basis of her ever-changing but undying life. It is something of this life that pervades the mind and heart of Arunyanath Chattopadhyay. In these days of, of India's life, as a great young nation among many nations of the world, where we in India are proclaiming that India has a message for the whole world, one priceless element of that message is revealed in the many works of Harindranath Chattopadhyay. I can only say that if anyone wants to discover a little of the hidden secret of India, about which many have written, but few have truly revealed, here is a poet who reveals something of that secret. See Jinraja Dasa. Many, many poets and critics have commented on Haran's poetry. And I will be reading some of those, which are often at the preface of, of some of his books. Here is another view by an excellent writer, Subroto Mukherjee. He writes, Arindranath was the quintessential Bengali intellectual, wealthy, high-born, highly strung, temperamental, eccentric, coruscatingly brilliant, but pardonably egoistic, proud of his abilities, but wasting them by his self-destructive tendencies, such as his compulsive philandering. He was marvelously gifted with an array of outstanding abilities, mostly underutilized, artist, poet, dramatist, actor, philosopher, and metaphysician. Chattopadhyay is typical of the towering intellects that have emerged from urban Bengal over the last two centuries. His father, Aparanath Chattopadhyay, was a scholar of Sanskrit, Greek, Hebrew, Persian, and English, and Harindranath caught the bug from him. The senior Chattopadhyay was principal of the famous Nizam's College at Hyderabad, now capital of Andhra Pradesh. His daughter, Harindranath's sister, happened to be Sarojini Naidu, the legendary nightingale of Bengal, and herself a fine poet, freedom fighter, and stunning orator. In later life, as worldly men are oft wont to do, Arindranath came face to face with his mortality and shed his egoism by an almost relieved surrender to the Supreme. This poem is a frank admission of his foolish obsession with himself in sheer neglect of the self. Humility followed self-realization and brought with it a glimpse of the larger purpose of the spirit. It is this surrender of the towering genius of Harindranath before his maker that brings a lump to the throat and forewarns all of us mortals so wrapped up in our own puny little egos that to shed the obsession with self is to enter 
into the arena of a greater consciousness where a transcendent experience awaits the awakening soul. As we in the ashram are aware, sadly, Harin turned away from mother and the ashram and never wrote such poetry again. Some years later, when he returned to the ashram for a visit, Amal Kiran Gedi Setna showed him the poems he had written while in those days under mother's grace. Amal said, when seeing them, Harin wept. We must remember that the divine never leaves us. No matter how many errant paths on which we stray, and it is my prayer that his poetry will one day receive the recognition that it deserves. Hence, all of the poems I have been able to collect will be read by various ashramites, some of who are actors, others who have been reading poetry for years, so that we can share with you perhaps hundreds of poems by Haring. End of part one.